being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Those 27 words are the driving force behind one of the most influential and least understood organizations in America, the National Rifle Association. Eighteen months ago, after Littleton, Colorado, Jonesboro, Arkansas, Conyers, Georgia, and Los Angeles, California, the NRA was under attack. The gun violence enraged millions of Americans. They said the NRA was part of the problem. Last year, the NRA was at its lowest point. We're often cast as the villain. That is not our role in American society, and we will not be forced to play it. This year, the NRA is feeling better. The NRA is back. Good evening, I'm Peter Jennings, and this is a broadcast about what it means for the NRA to be back. Not that it ever went away. But it is a newly invigorated NRA with many, many new members who'd been frightened by all those calls for more gun control. This is a war as far as the NRA is concerned, and tonight we will see in detail how the NRA deals with its enemies and some of those who used to be friends. Everyone we've interviewed for this broadcast is in favor of owning guns. This is not a broadcast about gun control, at least not directly. It's about power. There's a political campaign raging in America. 80 million gun owners are more of a political force than Al Gore can handle. If aroused, if awakened, if angry. A lot of people who own guns are angry at Al Gore. Last weekend at the New Holland Gun Club in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, NRA member Charles Jones volunteered to tell his fellow gun owners what they can do about it. This would not even be a contest if all of us voted our guns, and that's what, that's what uh, the NRA is asking you to do, is vote your guns. Pennsylvania is now one of the states on which this election may turn, but in all the battleground states, there are hundreds of NRA volunteers encouraging gun owners to vote against Gore. And I don't want someone coming to my door, knocking on my door, and telling me that I have to surrender my gun. The NRA campaign against Al Gore is massive. At their convention in North Carolina this year, it was the single overriding topic. All of this spells very serious trouble for a man named Gore. The NRA's president is Charlton Heston. Time and again, he brings the NRA activists to their feet. For everyone within the sound of my voice, to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. From my cold, dead hands. Do you think this is an unusually tough year? I would put it another way. I think this is the most important election in the last century and a half. I really think so. Throughout history, without exception, where governments register guns, governments confiscate guns. And that won't happen here, Mr. Gore. Charlton Heston is the NRA celebrity, but Wayne LaPierre, the executive vice president, is the power. He's a 50-year-old former school teacher from Roanoke, Virginia who has made the NRA into what it is today. 
we don't have to tell the American public what's going on. They see what's going on. And they come to us and they say, do something about it. Fight for me. I need a voice. Do you really think it's a trend in the country that if you weren't resisting somehow, there would be a calculated, persuasive, comprehensive effort to take guns away from people? I believe with all my heart, if NRA fails, the Second Amendment fails. There are millions of gun owners in the country who believe that, and this year they are joining the NRA in record numbers. Because they believe that if Al Gore is elected, he will try to take away their guns. I think the Clinton-Gore administration, I don't know what their objective is other than an outright gun grab to take the Second Amendment rights away from us. If Gore becomes president, I absolutely believe that that is what their ultimate goal is, to disarm the people. Did you really worry that the government might come along and try to take all your guns away? Yes, definitely. Oh, yes. Definitely. Definitely. I've thought that for years. Millions and millions of Americans view their relationship with government through the issue of guns. Guns are a, a way of viewing their freedom. How much does the government trust them as citizens? And they see it and feel it viscerally on this issue. Richard Feldman has worked for the NRA and the gun manufacturers. He believes in the right to own and use guns, and he knows how the NRA operates. It does a very good job of motivating its members to do the things in a democracy that give it political muscle. This year, the NRA has used its political muscle on Al Gore and Bill Clinton. That death is on the president's hands. He needs a certain level of violence in this country. LaPierre accused Clinton and Gore of letting violent criminals go free so the administration could push for more laws that control guns. That blood is on his hand. Prosecuted, he would have prevented the death. Lack of I really regret that the... the NRA leader, I guess he was frustrated. But LaPierre knew exactly what he was doing. The director of the NRA went off the deep end the other day with those intemperate blood comments. He was picking a fight in which he knew the rules. That mean no apology. No apology. In just a few weeks after this attack on the administration, the NRA says it signed up 200,000 new members. They've gotten into this mindset where every time there's a good fight, they know the membership's going to go up. They know the contributions are probably going to start rolling in. And they need to have those kinds of fights in order to maintain. It's a big operation, 500 employees, multiple consultants. This is a big operation. Some of your friends in the pro-gun industry say that what the NRA is ultimately interested in is a good fight, that a good fight is good for the NRA in every respect. So you don't want to resolve the issue. I'd, I'd simply, we're more than willing to fight the fight if someone's trying to take away the freedom, and we don't back away from that. I'm proud of it. it uh, I mean, you trample the Second Amendment, you're going to have to deal with the NRA. That's the message that gets to the most committed rank and file. The differences between the candidates running for the highest office of this country are stark. At the convention, a lot of time was spent on a strategy to get as many gun owners as possible to vote against those they think threaten their guns. We already have over 500 people on our volunteer list. All right. We're going to damn well kick their butts this way. It is scary if you went to the meetings today to hear what can happen to us that we could lose freedom. A lot of our freedoms if we don't have the support of the NRA. Your critics uh, accuse you of promoting fear. How do you respond to that? I, I think, I, again, I smile, but the fear that's out there doesn't come from the NRA. The, the fear comes from the fact that, uh, in terms of individual citizens, that they fear the government is going to come in and take away their ability to own a firearm. It's not hard to get the impression you think there's a government conspiracy against you. There is a global contagion in this country that's moving from England to Australia to Canada that's funded by those governments to deprive free people in the world of the right to own a firearm. And do you believe the U.S. government is part of that conspiracy? Or the administration is part of that conspiracy? I think the Clinton administration certainly aids it. With four weeks to go in the presidential campaign, Al Gore and the NRA know full well where this election can be won or lost. 
the battleground states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, and Missouri. You bet. Thank you. The NRA and Al Gore are fighting to convince the same people, union members, many of whom are also gun owners. The NRA says it has 40% more members in these battleground states than last year. So go, go directly and say exactly what the union guys are saying. Exactly. You know, I mean, George Bush is better for my freedom. If that's what we're trying to point out, then let's go right to it. Ten days ago, the NRA staff met in Washington with their advertising consultants to plan strategy for the final push. Gore has the same polls we do and everyone else does. He knows he could lose this election on this issue in many of these key battleground states. And uh, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a focus group issue. What we need to do as we go through these is let's decide which ones get the points out and which ones don't. Have you noticed how Al Gore stopped talking about your gun rights? Earlier, he had plenty to say for gun registration, licensing. The NRA will spend 15 to 20 million dollars in this year's elections. Much of that will be spent on television in these last four weeks. Charlton Heston is the messenger. Is he afraid of gun owners' votes? Because if Al Gore wins, gun owners better be afraid of him. Vote George Bush for president. Come November. We're going to carry the great state of Pennsylvania. I'm so honored you came out. The NRA has said that if George Bush is elected, they'll have a friend in the White House. As governor of Texas, Mr. Bush advocated legislation the NRA supported. That I believe law-abiding citizens should be allowed to protect themselves and their family. Including a law permitting Texans to carry concealed weapons. Bush and Gore agree on some gun issues, such as the need for background checks on people who buy guns. Al Gore, however, wants to license handgun owners. To the NRA, licensing means registration, which they say will lead to confiscation. And they just don't trust Al Gore. Have been given the impression from higher... When he was a congressman from Tennessee, Gore supported the NRA, and they supported him. When Gore ran for the Senate in 84, the NRA wrote, Al Gore has been there each and every time sportsmen and gun owners have needed a friend. Al Gore is committed to your Second Amendment rights. For 16 years, Al Gore's at our doorstep, wanting our, our endorsement, wanting NRA money, uh, voting with NRA on every single vote, and then he, he decides he wants to run for president in 88 and get through the New York primary. So in a New York minute, he changes his position. I believe in the right of sportsmen and hunters and law-abiding citizens to own firearms. Gore says he has always supported the right of law-abiding citizens to own firearms, but he believes there is too much gun violence now and new laws are needed. And he believes there is nothing inconsistent about supporting the right to own a gun and more gun control. The NRA says he's betrayed the cause. So I think we make sure that every voter in those key states has a piece of paper from us in their hand telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I think if we do, I think it will tip those states. And this fall holds the most critical confrontation the Second Amendment has ever faced. These elections will set the heading of freedom's course for your lifetime. With the presidential race so close, the NRA says it can determine the outcome. LaPierre says the NRA has much more support than most people realize. We're every age group, we're blue collar, we're white collar, uh, we're America. 14 million people tell the pollsters they're members of the NRA. 23 million people tell the pollsters they're affiliated with the NRA in some way. I mean, those types of numbers start to approach, approach the affiliation numbers of the Democrat and the Republican Party. It is naturally in the interest of the NRA to advertise its influence, but how effective is the NRA really? When we come back, influence at work. What the NRA did to two friends who got out of line.
Peter Jennings reporting. The gun fight will continue in a moment. What have you grabbed with your pledge grab it? I'm afraid to look. Dust and hairs and fuss. To even get the pretzel? Just keeps picking it up. Oh, how embarrassing. Picked up quite a bit of dust and dog hair. They grabbed it all. A dead moth or something like that. Gross. Maybe even some toothpaste. I mean, I see crumbs in here. Oh, see, here's a dog treat. It grabs the dust. It does. Grab it! S.C. Johnson, a family company. Smell ginger peach. Smell mango. Smell wonderful things that will make your blood pressure say thank you. Feel velvet. Feel leather. Feel your body go limp as it surrenders to total comfort. Feel good about new bedroom furniture because now it's 20 to 30 percent off. The one-of-a-kind experience of Pier 1. Get in touch with your senses. Already the critic fight continues. Once again, Peter Jennings. No one should be under any illusions about how rough a game the NRA can play when it feels that gun ownership is threatened. Beyond that, the NRA wants its friends, as well as its enemies, to know that the NRA intends to control the political agenda in the gun debate. And if you're an ally that gets out of line, be prepared to pay. The Colt 45. The Remington pump action shotgun. The Smith & Wesson 38 Special. Since the NRA was founded in 1871, the companies that manufacture these guns have been the NRA's allies. They have fought together against gun control. So we were surprised to see that the NRA can treat its friends just like it treats its enemies. To do what we all know is right for our children. Three years ago today, some of the NRA's best friends joined President Clinton in the White House Rose Garden to announce an agreement. And Bill Clinton is the NRA's enemy. I'm pleased to announce that eight of the largest handgun manufacturers will now provide child safety devices with every new handgun they sell. The manufacturers had agreed to provide a safety lock with every handgun sold. They were responding to public opinion and political reality. They are inspiring examples. The man who brought the manufacturers and the administration together was Richard Feldman. After working for the NRA, Feldman was now running a gun industry trade group, the American Shooting Sports Council. Bill Clinton is uh, probably not my choice for president, um, but uh, I saw that our interests in the industry and the White House, for whatever reason, were on the same page on gun safety for kids. To me, there was just no downside. One of the people Feldman took to the White House that day was the president of Smith & Wesson. Ed Schultz has been around guns all his life. Smith & Wesson is the nation's largest handgun manufacturer. The issue here is how do we perpetuate an industry successfully? It's either going to adjust uh, to what the citizenry believes makes common sense or it'll be obliterated. On the day that Feldman, Schultz and the other gun makers met with the president, the NRA was noticeably absent. When the gun makers agreed at the press event in the Rose Garden to ship locks with their guns, um, were you opposed to it? We, we, have, we have always supported safety locks in this country. I mean, I have resented the way people have tried to characterize NRA as somehow anti-safety lock because that's never been our position. Was your, were you in favor of the gun makers shipping locks with their guns? It, I think it's their decision, but if they make that decision to do it, we're in favor of it. After the event, you got a letter from Wayne LaPierre at the National Rifle Association. Oh, uh, yes, I did. What, in general terms, as best you can remember, what did he say to you? The letter basically said that single-handedly I had uh, put the Second Amendment on the slippery slope to uh, being destroyed. The letter said many things, all of them strong. The gunmakers had been conned by the White House, LaPierre wrote, whose real agenda was not safety, but banning guns. 
The meeting with Clinton was a grievous error, he said, and now it's up to your consumers to keep it from being a fatal error. You described them as being your friends and allies in the defense of freedom in America. And yet you write to them in a very sarcastic way. What did the quest for a few minutes of media attention of Bill Clinton buy you? It will never end. You should know better. That's almost a put down. Well, I think it was. Why would you be so tough on your friends? It's no different than it, it, if you, and I don't mean this like it sounds, but the truth is, if you see a, a child about to walk out on the street and be hit by a car, you say, stop. And we saw this industry, which was politically naive. They simply manufacture a lawful product in many ways about to be taken to the cleaners by a shark. Not, not for the motives that, that, that they were saying, but with an underlying agenda they were never revealing. They treated you as if you were absolute novices in Washington. They spoke to you as if you were politically naive. Did you really feel you were that naive? No, but you know, you have to look at the other side of this thing is that the, the NRA wants to be the spokesman for the industry. And the NRA clearly speaks for people who buy our products, but it doesn't speak for the industry. But with a letter, Wayne LaPierre put the gun industry on notice. Don't cross the NRA. And the once close relationship between the NRA and Richard Feldman was terminated. Well, I think I took the uh, role of uh, persona non grata over at NRA by having the audacity to stand next to Bill Clinton uh, in the Rose Garden and state what we stated that day. They, I think, saw that as a threat to their leadership on the gun issue and they just weren't going to tolerate anyone else having a say, whether it was the industry or a rival organization, they were going to do whatever it took to get rid of their competition. But ostensibly everybody's on the same side here when it comes to the issue of guns. Yeah, but the devil's in the details. Or is the devil in who controls the details? Both. Which is more important? Sometimes the control factor is far more important than the policy factor. The issue of who controls the debate came up again when a number of mayors from around the country threatened to sue the gun makers, holding them responsible for gun violence in their cities. Why are you producing weapons and guns to kill police officers on our streets? Why are you doing that? If you continue to manufacture unsafe weapons, it's going to cost you. The mayors also said that the gun manufacturers turned a blind eye when their guns were sold to criminals. Once again, Richard Feldman got ready to defend his industry. This was a tremendous threat to the survival of uh, the companies that we represented. And coming on the heels of the tobacco lawsuits, uh, we knew that the lawyers who would be involved were going to have some unbelievable resources at their disposal, resources that the industry didn't have. But once again, when Feldman and the gun makers began to act independently and tried to broker a deal with the cities, the NRA turned on them. How did the National Rifle Association react? Again, they weren't going to control the agenda, so they didn't like the fact that anyone else was playing on the block. Did the NRA do everything it could to close down the negotiations? We did everything we could to advise the manufacturers that if they were going to do it, to know what they were about and to watch the wallet because some of these people we believed were not sincere. But we never told them, I mean, it's, it's their decision. Did you work to have Richard Feldman, who led the negotiations, removed from his job? I didn't. I mean, I did not personally do anything. There you were did. people here, uh, Jim Baker made it very clear to the industry that he felt Richard Feldman was doing the entire movement a disservice. I became the enemy. And uh, what one does when they're in battle is try and get rid of the enemy. Is the firearms industry afraid of the National Rifle Association? There is a fear factor. And uh, in the same way that politicians can be cowered by that kind of political muscle, industry uh, moguls can be even more so. Clearly, someone was intimidated. At the beginning of last year, the gunmakers caved into NRA pressure. Richard Feldman was fired. 
and the gunmaker's lobby that he'd run was closed down. It looked briefly like the NRA had had its way again, that the manufacturers would not settle with the cities. And then Smith & Wesson settled. I think everyone knows Ed Schultz from Smith & Wesson. After two years of negotiating with the mayors, Ed Schultz agreed that Smith & Wesson would manufacture and sell its guns differently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Earlier today, Smith and Wesson signed a landmark agreement. The company agreed to make guns easier to trace. They told their dealers they could only sell Smith and Wesson to people who took safety courses. They would only sell to people at gun shows who submitted to background checks. In no time at all, the NRA accused Smith and Wesson of selling out. The NRA encouraged its members to boycott Smith & Wesson. At the NRA convention this year, many NRA members told us they would. In other words, our attitude was to put Smith & Wesson out of business. You gonna boycott Smith & Wesson? Yes, sir. Here you go, sir. Boycott Smith & Wesson. I told them that I wouldn't buy any more of their product line because they bellied up to the Clinton administration. Despite the pressure, Ed Schultz went to the NRA convention. You now have uh, the National Rifle Association as a pretty formidable enemy. How much of a difference does that make to business? I don't know, but we'll find out over the next uh, uh, few months, I suppose, or the next few years. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, we're doing what's in the best interest of our own company, and they are the ones that have decided that, that we're the enemy. Uh, Smith & Wesson is a big name. It's a great enemy to have, you know. Communism is dead, so you might as well attack Smith and Wesson. Some of the gun makers, I think, value the freedom maybe not as much as the NRA does or American gun owners. And we've told the industry, look, we, whether you like it or not, this has now become a battle about the freedom, and we're in. This battle about freedom, as Mr. LaPierre keeps calling it, has cost Smith & Wesson sales. And as of today, no other company has settled with the cities. Peter Jennings reporting. The gun fight will continue in a moment. The NRA has many friends and allies. But all a friend needs to do is make one mistake. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Congressman Bart Stupak has been a loyal friend of the NRA since he was first elected from Upper Michigan in 1992. We've never voted to take away a gun. We're not going to. This fall, he is in a tough race for re-election. The NRA has made it tough. It's campaign time, and you're hearing claims from my opponent that just aren't true. I'm a hunter, have been since I was a kid. I've never voted to take away a single gun. Never. What's the gun culture like in your district? Well, everyone grew up with guns. We know them. We respect them. Uh, most of us are NRA members. I am. Uh, it's just part of our life. Bart Stupak is a Democrat, what's called an NRA Democrat. Between 1992 and 99, Stupak voted with the NRA 100% of the time and the NRA supported his campaigns, nearly $50,000 in the last seven years. And this year, not a penny. The NRA wants to pack beaten because of a single vote. I don't want to run anybody out of the NRA, but I, but I, I certainly disagree with his vote. It's a key vote for us. It's a vote that we're going to take forward into this election. Congressman Stupak opposed the NRA on a bill which the NRA said would be the death of the Second Amendment. The NRA actually described it as the most important vote in the last 20 years. Mr. Stupak supported an amendment to a juvenile justice bill that would give the federal government 72 hours to complete a background check on anyone wanting to buy a gun at a gun show. The NRA supported an amendment that would only allow 24 hours for a background check but it also would have watered down some existing gun laws. Mr. Stupak says the NRA lied to him and to his constituents about the content and the impact of the legislation. And now, he says, the NRA is trying to end his political career. 
Congressman Bart Stupak's office. They, they, they punish those who go astray, and they reward their friends. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that I would become a target of the NRA. I had many members, they came to me and said, you don't want to do this. The NRA can make life miserable for you. Other members of Congress actually came and warned you that if you voted against yes. the NRA, they'd make your life difficult. Yes. Stupak is a former state trooper who believes there should be a background check before a gun is sold. Thousands of criminals have been kept from getting guns at gun stores since background checks were instituted. Stupak believes the same rules should apply to all sales at gun shows. How long does it normally take for a background check? 95%, actually the state of Michigan, 98% of people are cleared in two hours. That last 5% or that 2% that we're trying to get at, where there's a questionable background, shouldn't we really take the time and check it before we give that individual a gun? I think we should. Uh, the but the NRA said that the legislation would cause gun shows to go out of business and would dismantle the foundation of freedom. We will not stand by and let that bill pass the House. The NRA began a major campaign in Stupak's district to change his mind. Stupak's office? Right. They've got certain districts at their target. Let me ask his These are the calls we've got so far. We were in Stupak's office in the days leading up to the vote. The office was inundated with phone calls and letters and emails from his constituents. Many of them were using the NRA's language. What I would do is uh, I would want to see, is this their feeling? Do they understand the issue? Or are they just doing it because the NRA said to call? The NRA sent letters to Stupak's district that played to gun owners' worst fears. They said the legislation he favored would register gun owners and that gun haters were trying to dismantle the Second Amendment, one step at a time. The mailings of the NRA, they're, they're always effective, but they've clouded the issue so much, people are really confused as to what's going on. We regularly hear from people who are pro-gun to their fingertips that the NRA will do whatever it takes to win. Fair and clean is all I'd add. And you think you've been fair and clean with Bob Absolutely, Stupak. absolutely. And, 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 I, and that's real important. When I get to the pearly gates, hopefully, I can look straight across and say, I told the truth about what was in that bill. Yes, absolutely, I believe that. In their letters to the constituents, back in my district, uh, they were saying that certain things would, would occur, certain things were in the legislation that were not. Is there anything wrong with the NRA argument that the 72-hour provision would close down gun shows? Yeah, because it's not true. Uh, gun shows right now have licensed dealers that have to do the background check, and they have up to 72 hours. And I've not seen a decrease in gun shows in my district, probably an increase in gun shows. It was a false argument. Stupak says the NRA twisted the facts deliberately in several ways. You had 72 hours? The NRA said the federal government is intentionally not prosecuting people who break the gun laws already on the books. Uh, Stupak heard okay. the argument repeated by many NRA members who called him. It's the state that does the prosecutions. This was the very same argument that LaPierre made when he attacked President Clinton earlier this year this president has presided over a complete lack of enforcement. I, I think that argument by NRA, and again, I'm a member, has not been real accurate. In Congressman Stupak's Capitol Hill office on the night that he would cast his vote with or against the NRA, it was fairly tense. The NRA worked on him right until the end. Just after 9 o'clock in the evening, the NRA's chief lobbyist, Chuck Cunningham, showed up. Is this the final vote on 1501, or where are they? They met for half an hour. Stupak said the NRA lobbyist yep, told him that he was making a big mistake. See you. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I'm a former police officer, I'm a member of the NRA, and I'm a lifelong gun owner. Stupak was voting against the NRA for the first time in his career. From the floor of the House, he tried to explain to the folks back home. By the same rules. I'm not interested in, and I will not vote to take away your guns. I will not try to control your guns. I want to make sure that every gun purchaser is treated the same. With so many gun owners and hunters in my district, the last vote and this vote are very tough votes for me politically. But you know, this is the right vote. 
I urge you to do the right thing. Vote for the McC McCarthy Amendment. The amendment that would have allowed 72 hours for background checks at gun shows failed. It was not a politically popular vote. Uh, I acknowledge that, but I mean, a lot of members just didn't want to fight the NRA. Stupak and every other House member knew that a vote against the NRA had its consequences. I mean, if, if you're going to take the risk, you'd like to be on the winning side. but. If things, if I'm wrong, I, if I don't come back here, no regrets is the right thing to do. I think when my district hears the whole story, I think they will be happy with the way I voted. So my challenge now is to go home and explain my vote. When he gets home, the NRA will be waiting for him. Peter Jennings reporting. The gun fight will continue in a moment. Three weeks after Bart Stupak voted against the NRA, he was back in his rural Michigan district having to deal with unhappy constituents. Recently, you voted on that bill regarding guns. About 80,000 hunters, uh, you sold them down the river, so to speak. Uh, I don't see how it hurt the hunter. At town meetings and VFW gatherings, Stupak had to explain time and again why he voted as he did. If you're a law-abiding citizen, and if you have to go through a background check, you're probably going to be cleared in two or three minutes. So much has been put out there about gun provisions, gun control, that's very difficult to get that message through. That's the difficult part I have. I'll admit the NRA was not happy with that vote. I spoke to them uh, the night before the vote and told them we did not appreciate the misinformation, and I don't think they did uh, accurately portray what was going on. Stupak told us that gun owners in his district had believed what the NRA said about the legislation, even though the NRA didn't tell the truth. Now what I have to do, and they know I can't, is go around and try to correct it with 586,000 constituents saying, look it, there wasn't this provision. But the NRA said there was, and it's hard to compete with the NRA at that route. It's very difficult to do. Yes, sir. I appreciate you being here. My yep. name is Gerald Light, and I am a member of the NRA. We have 20,000 laws, or approximately 20,000 gun laws right now on the books, and, you know, they're not being enforced, and that's obvious, and that's been pointed out. Now, I'd just be interested in a show of hands in this group right here as to how many people do not want more gun control. Bart Stupak is forced to deal time and again with the centerpiece of the NRA argument that the federal government fails to enforce the existing gun laws, that no new laws are needed. In his letter to Stupak's constituents, Wayne LaPierre said that a total lack of prosecution of those who illegally try to purchase guns has returned thousands of predators to the streets. You said in the letter that not one of these, as you call them, predators was federally prosecuted in three straight years. Do you think that's true? I, I should have said one. <laughs> It was zero in 96, zero in 97, and one in 98. In fact, there were more than 600 people who were prosecuted at the federal level and sent to jail in that period. There may be some local prosecutions that These were done under federal. state law. Federal. These are federal. Are you talking within the last year I'm or talking last couple within, of months? I'm talking within exactly the same three years. I'll stick with our figures as opposed to those figures you have. The U.S. Sentencing Commission told us the federal government did prosecute and convict more than 600 people who illegally tried to purchase a gun during the period LaPierre says there was only one. I'd be happy if those figures were true, but I just don't believe they are based on everything I've seen. And that's the honest, we want prosecutions. But That's is, where is, we're coming This from. is not about whether you want prosecutions. This is about whether or not you're telling the Bart truth? Stupak's neighbors uh, the hey, truth or whether you're distorting the truth or whether you're manipulating the truth. This is the first time we've ever been challenged by anybody on the fact that we would not be telling the truth on that provision. They haven't been prosecuting. LaPierre implies that no one is ever prosecuted. In fact, these crimes also violate state laws and are prosecuted by the states. The NRA rarely mentions this fact. 
Wayne, you know what the issue is here. You wrote finally in this letter. You wrote finally in this letter. The air in this town is so thick right. with deceit Absolutely. and dishonesty about this gun scheme. You, you wrote this it. to Bart Stupak's neighbor. I stand by every word of it. A guy who stood by you throughout his entire career, 100% voting record with the NRA, and he says to us, you are the ones who are deceitful and dishonest. Well, I don't agree with that. And I guess we'll see what happens in the election in November. Have you tried to recruit someone to run against him? I haven't personally tried to, but I hope somebody does. So, Mr. Yob, how goes your campaign? It's going really well. It's really exciting. We met Bart Stupak's opponent at the Republican convention this summer. His name is Chuck Yob. He says LaPierre did encourage him to run. Me running, and of course, Wayne LaPierre is a personal friend of mine, and uh, so he was very instrumental in talking to me, and uh, I think that all the whole, the whole uh, group of NRA people were supporting him. This year, the NRA will monitor nearly 2,000 local, state, and national elections and spend millions of dollars on those races where it thinks it can make a difference. Bart Stupak's congressional race is one small battle for the NRA in the great ongoing gunfight. In Washington, Wayne LaPierre believes if your mission is defending freedom, you can never rest. Hey, I, mean, I understand this town. There are lobbyists, there are consultants, there are fundraisers, there are staff people that get up every day with only one purpose in mind, to ban guns. And when they get one provision, they have to come back the next day or they'll go out of business. They'll lose their check. So the, they immediately invent another fight and another fight and another fight. I mean, because they can never stop, because this is what they do for a living. And I understand that. It's also what you do for a living. It, it's a, we do a lot more than that, though. I mean, but but, but this, this particular legislative war, which you're in all the time, mm -hmm. is what you do for a living. That's right. We're proud of it. I mean, I want people, when they think of the NRA, to think of standing up for this freedom. I mean, if you believe in this freedom, join the National Rifle Association. If you don't, don't join. Peter Jennings reporting. The gun fight will continue in a moment. When we look at the exit polls on election night, we'll be able to see just how well the NRA did. Did enough gun owners vote only their guns? Or did they see a larger picture? I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you. Good night. If you would like to purchase a video cassette or transcript of this program, call 1 800 Call ABC or visit our website, abcnewsstore.com. To learn more about the National Rifle Association and to share your views, visit us on the internet at abcnews.com. This has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.